all our kids are doing is they're mirroring us. If we're unhappy, if we're unsettled, if we're not at rest, these empath kids will completely mirror that back to us. They will be at disrest. They will be at disharmony. They will even fall ill. Hello, beautiful soul sparklers. My name is Darcy Legg. Welcome to Darcy's Mindful Magic. The segment is called Growing Up Empathic, a show where empaths lovingly share how they grew up empathically sensitive. This will help support all your wonderful empathic children, making each day better. And I am more than thrilled to have Stephanie Moore with me today, sharing her wisdom. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Stephanie. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. For those of you who have not had the pleasure mm -hmm. of meeting Stephanie, I'm going to give you a little taste of her background. Stephanie Moore is a shamanic energy medicine practitioner, emergency medical technician, and emergency veterinarian nurse. She practices shamanic energy healing at the Village Wellness. And I'll post the link at the bottom of your screen and also in the description box below. Stephanie grew up in Wayne, Pennsylvania, where she graduated from Renault College with a Bachelor's of Arts in English. Her call to shamanism and energy healing came to her in 2010 when she picked up Alberto Valdo's book, Shaman Healer Sage. Stephanie believes in green juice, Epsom salt, fast, eating in bed, kissing animals on the lips, and shamanic journey. She works on the basis of love. She embodies non-attachment and non-judgment with no expectations. For her, the ultimate fun would be hiking some distant mountain forest with family, friends, and getting lost in nature and building So the first question I have for you today is mm -hmm. share with us a story that illustrates what it is like growing up sensitive or empathic. Yeah. So first of all, thanks for that great introduction. I feel like if I were on a dating show, someone would totally pick me off of that. Didn't so win. thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I love to keep things light and really happy, but I got to tell you, it was really hard for me growing up as an empath. First of all, I didn't even, I didn't know that term. My parents didn't know that term. Parents are children of industrial revolution parents. So really the emphasis was always on hard work, on grit, on anything that's worth doing is going to hurt, is going to be painful, is going to require little to no emotional reaction, but rather the mental body and the physical body being fully engaged and actually ignoring the emotional being. So it was hard. It was really hard. I was the third child as well. So the three, the third of three children and my siblings were very close. My brother was a year older. My sister's two years older. So I think being born in that order too was really difficult because I'm a parent now, so I get it. But by the time you get to the third, it's not that you're ignoring them or that you don't love them. It's that you are in a groove and you have older kids. And sometimes I think the kids, the needs of the younger kids aren't met, especially emotionally. I was bullied by my brother and sister when I was younger. I'm dear friends with them now, but they'll admit they bullied me. They teamed up on me and it was because I was sensitive and so they could get a rise out of me. So they knew they could trigger me. They knew they could get me screaming and crying. It was really difficult because 
as an empathic kid, I was very sensitive emotionally and also physically and extremely creative as well. Imagine imagination was very active. So that combination, I think, requires a really attentive, a really sensitive parent to nurture that. And I was often called too sensitive or I was called an exaggerator because as I would describe a story or something, I would be coined as, oh, you're inflating this, you're exaggerating, you're lying. But to me, when I was explaining it, I was explaining it from the place of how I experienced it. You know, which may not have matched what it really looked like to someone who was observing or to maybe the other child who was involved. One thing I won't forget, and I still don't forget, and when I'm doing work on myself and working with my inner child, I keep revisiting this place where they, you're too sensitive. Oh, she's just too sensitive. Stop being so sensitive. And what it did is it put this really negative connotation on being sensitive. You know, it was like I would do things then to avoid being called sensitive. So I did things to toughen up. This was the early childhood. As I got older, probably when I hit about 11 or 12, it's when I started doing things to escape, escapism things, because my sensitivity wasn't being honored the way that I was feeling, the way that I was seeing. I was being regularly by my family, my siblings and my parents being called too sensitive, an exaggerator, a liar. Oh, she makes things up. And it was really crushing. And so to avoid that, I kind of retreated into my own world. And this led to about 12 years old starting to use drugs. So starting to smoke pot, starting to experiment with drugs, with alcohol with sex at such like a young age. And it was because I was lost and no one understood me. And I was trying to find other ways to express, you know? If the wind gets too loud, just let me know. Cause it's starting to get stormy here, but I'm talking about stormy things. So it's I know. getting stormy. But, I'm like, oh, I'm um, hearing yeah, that. Yeah, oh. yeah. And so, Looking back on it, this was just a natural process for me. It was a ne mechanism to protect myself. And I didn't have much emotional support. And I didn't know I could ask for it. I didn't know it was available. It led to having an eating disorder when I was about 16 years old. And, you know, I don't blame my parents and my siblings for this. They... I understand how they did the best with what they had. They didn't have the resources. As I do this healing work, I say, wow, they couldn't support me because they weren't supported as children because of how they grew up. So it's, it's not a blame game. It's just how it unfolded. But I remember there were times when I remember being probably like four or five and my parents would go out to dinner probably about once a week and I would lay in bed and I wouldn't be able to sleep until they got home because I would worry about them. At that age, I would worry about my parents. How about that? My other siblings, they would just, they would go to bed and, and that would be it. But I wouldn't be able to sleep because I worried. I wanted to make sure they got home safely. And so, you know, I'd crawl out of my toddler bed and I would wait for them downstairs. And I knew the sound of the garage door opening. And so as soon as the garage door would open, I knew I would get in trouble for not being in bed. So I would hide under the dining room table. And I would watch them then when they came in. And sometimes they would come in really happy, maybe had a few drinks, doing some more partying, dancing around the kitchen. And I would watch and I would just observe. But then there would be other times where they would come home and they would fight. They would come home and they would be fighting because been consuming alcohol or whatever it is and so I would sit there hiding and I would watch them and I would watch them fight and I would just take it in and then sometimes I would pop out and try to stop them this young age I would try to stop them from fighting because I couldn't sleep I couldn't rest when they were fighting or 
even when they were having a good time, there was that, I guess the, the kids call it FOMO now, you know, the fear of missing out. And so it was just being so highly sensitive that really what that illustrates is that nothing could happen in my house without me being acutely aware of it, without me absorbing it or without me injecting myself or being a part of it or feeling like in some way that I could disrupt maybe a fight or an argument and, and change it somehow by, by making someone feel better or something like that. Really, it really wasn't, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy growing up like that. And those are really the younger years. As I got into middle school and stuff, which is just such a tough time for kids, whether they're empaths or not, right? It's just, there's so much energy. You're shifting physically, hormonally into this new place. And I just, I really did everything I could to kind of disappear. And the move that my parents did, which was so helpful, and they did it for different reasons. They did it because they wanted me to make the field hockey team. They sent me to a private school, an all-girls private school. I went to the Baldwin School in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, where in a whole class, there were, there were 30 girls in my graduating class. And this gave me a huge opportunity it, to be seen. And of course, I didn't want to be seen, but I was seen and I was acknowledged. And it's a very liberal arts type uh, of education. So I was given the opportunity to express and to create. And the classrooms were you know, in circles rather than in lines. Just, I am so thankful for this education because if I had gone to some big high school where there was 400 people in the graduating class, I would have disappeared. I would have fallen away because talk about energy overload, right? And so now looking back on it, this education really supported me. Going into college, I went to a small college as well. And I started to kind of disappear again, but I joined a sorority, which was kind of double-edged for me, but also got me in with a tight-knit group of women who honored me as a healer for the first time in my life. And I didn't know it at that time, but looking back, I know now I was the girl everyone came to when they needed advice if they were in a jam, if there was a problem, if they had some rash or if they had some itch or if they thought they were pregnant or if they needed an ear. And, and that made me, again, feel heard. It made me feel acknowledged. It made me feel supported. So found my way. You know, here I am. But I, I found my way, but it was definitely a tough time for me to, to answer your question. Yeah. There was actually, the, oh, thank you. And the one thing I must say, the one thing that I remember so vividly about being an uh, empath child is that my connection with animals and with nature was just off the charts. Amazing. So if you suspect that you have a very sensitive or empathetic child, watch them, watch them around. I know we'll get to this question about kind of how we can support these kids, but mm -hmm. You'll know. Watch them. Are they connecting a lot with nature? Are they connecting a lot with the animals? It's a great way if you as parents do not have it in you to give them everything they need, which I totally understand. Support them in that way because that's it's really important. You've already answered my second question that I had about how your parents supported you, how they sent you to the private school. Is there anything else that they did that you feel like was really yeah. helpful? to support you? Yeah, they sent me, I think they kind of didn't really know what to do with me. And they sent me to camp. They sent me to this nature camp. And I, I rode horses. Like I said, I had this connection with animals. And so they were like, look, you're not in school. We're going to send you to this camp. And they sent me to camp for like two months over the summer where I rode horses every day, where I was able to connect with animals swim in the lake and and I went to this camp for like six or seven years straight oh, wow. and it was really honestly it was so nourishing to be to be in nature to be around the animals to be in nature to have that thing that felt like it was just for me which was the horseback riding
My parents knew nothing about it, but they still supported it. I don't know if anyone knows, but if your kid's interested in horses, it gets expensive. There's a lot of stuff. To, and I know that they didn't need to spend that money, but it um, meant to me and how important that was to my well-being. And so I'm just so grateful for that. Okay. As a parent, what works best with you for your children struggle when they're struggling with being sensitive or empathic? <sighs> yeah, this is a big one. I have two kids, one's seven and one's two, and they're both very sensitive and empathic, but in different ways. <laughs> My son, the seven-year-old, he's kind of a typical empathic. Extremely loving, big heart, extremely sensitive, always trying to correct the situation, always trying to give, always trying to help. And so first start by saying, parents, I get it. It's hard. It's hard and it's a gift, but it is, it's a gift that you have to work with really deeply with a lot of patience. And it's funny because I'm not sure that it's exactly the word I'm looking for, but karmic in the sense that it's like, I'm looking at a little me. It's a mirror. Our kids mirror us. And so I want to remind parents that a lot of times our children are mirroring us. So when you're seeing something in them, it's reflecting from you. When there's a frustration about the kids being too sensitive or whatever that is, do yourself a favor and do them a favor and hold up the mirror and say, okay, where inside of me am I sensitive that I'm ignoring it or I'm not acknowledging it or I'm not allowing that to be present? Because I find a lot of times probably, and this is not the answer everyone's expecting, the best thing you can do to support your child is to do your own healing work. That would be the number one, because so often we as parents, and it's a natural impulse as parents to reach out and fix out here, to manage everyone, to make sure everyone's where they should be and everyone's happy. And, and really all our kids are doing is they're mirroring us. If we're unhappy, if we're unsettled, if we're not at rest, these em empath kids will completely mirror that back to us. They will be at disrest. They will be at disharmony. They will even fall ill or have tantrums or be prone to injury or learning disabilities or stuff like that. And so really the first reach you want to do is in this way. It's doing the, the emotional U-turn, we call it, and pointing it back to you. I have some tools that I'll tell you about, but first I want to tell you a story when my son, my son was a surprise and I wasn't prepared yet. We had only been married six months. I was not prepared to have a child. Um, I was in the future, but not right away. I had only had about a year and a half of energy work, spiritual work, even self-reflection as a practice under my belt. So I was very new, very green at all. So I had no idea what I was doing. And so the first few years, I mean, he was so easy as a child. So the first few years they were easy, but then as he got to be three or four, this is when that personality, when these impulses started to emerge, you know, of realizing, wow, he's really sensitive. He's really different. Probably around four years old, he came down with what I believe was a virus. For months, he had swollen lymph nodes from here all the way down to his groin. Oh. He had on and off fevers. He had belly pain, aching belly pain at night, joint pain, waking up screaming. First we were like, oh, maybe it's growing pains. And so it continued and, and, I, and I actually ended up taking him to the doctor because it was interfering with a lot of life started to look into things, testing him for leukemia and wanting to test him for cancer and other stuff like this. And it was like, whoa, this is really serious. Mm -hmm. And so I had just finished the first part of my training and I called my teacher. I called, I, I, I said, I need an appointment. And they said, 
and this is, I will never forget this. He said, yeah, I can do the work. Okay. I can, I can help. I can do a session. It's going to be like a million dollars. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it might as well have been. And I was like, oh, okay, but you know, okay. Anything for my son. I, I, at the time I didn't have money. My business wasn't up and running. But I was like, I'll save the money. I'll just do it. He said, here's the good news though. It's, I don't need to have the session with your son. It's you. It's you that needs the healing. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll get around to that. Yeah, I'll call you back. And it was like, I didn't want to spend the money on myself. I didn't really understand how healing me could heal my son. So needless to say, again, I was like, well, if this is for my son, I'll do it. And I did it. And I had the healing. I had two healing sessions with him. And it all came back to this trauma that I had when I was younger that I had suppressed that was expressing, wanting to express at this time in my life, but I wasn't allowing it to. And so in the act of shutting it down, I was creating this hostile environment and this emotionally unsafe environment for my son during this really, really special time of three or four years old when that second chakra, that emotional center mm -hmm. is starting to really bloom, is starting to really take form. And so his whole body was reacting to that, to that hostile emotional environment that I was creating, not outwardly, there wasn't a ton of yelling and screaming, but mm -hmm. it was this act of me suppressing. And to the point where he was experiencing that and it was like coming out of his lymph nodes, it was coming out of his body. And so he said, look, you do this work, you do your homework. He gave me some techniques, some tools to do. We did a soul retrieval. And within three weeks after, after being with this virus, this pain with him for three or four months, after three weeks, he was totally symptom free. And he never had another symptom of this again. But it was because I turned inward and I did that work. And it's this place of, I was not doing what I was asking him to do which is acknowledge and feel and express his emotions, you know, which takes me to the best tool for parents is to acknowledge, acknowledge the children. Just listen to them. You don't have to understand what they're saying, but get down and get in, get on in the eye contact, you know, get on the floor if it's a little one so that you're eye to eye. Sometimes you say, oh, I want to tell you about this, about this green monster. I want to tell you all about it. And this is like the 300th time they're going to tell you about it, right? So uh -huh. naturally you want to be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you tell me about it later. We'll talk all about it, right? I get it. Yeah. But there's something about it. It's not that they want to tell you this story. It's that they want to express. They're wanting to express be an emotion or an energy that's present. And this is them learning how to express. And so they're, if they can't express through words, if they don't have the safe space to express through words, then they're going to start expressing other ways, like screaming, like tantrums, like sadness, like anger. So sometimes if, you know, we're tired of hearing about that, you know, that, that damn green dragon, whatever it is for the 300th time. But we get down anyway and we say, tell me all about it. I have two minutes while dinner is cooking. You tell me all about that green dragon. And they'll say, and it's big and it likes to eat fish and I love it so much and it's so special. Okay, thanks. Bye. And they, <laughs> and they take off. And it's like, it, it's, it's not painful, but it takes patience. It takes being present, being fully present. And I know that's so hard, but you do it parents as long as you can. If that's 10 seconds, if that's 30 seconds, if that's 30 minutes, you be present. You put down your phone, you put down everything you're doing, you move the food onto the back burner and you be present with them because that's, especially at that age, it's learn that them learning that they can express, that it's safe to express and that they're encouraged and you're acknowledging and you're allowing that expression. So many times parents spend so much money, so much time, so much energy on buying toys, facilitating play, taking the kids to the jump park, the playground, and all of this. 
it's discharging so much energy. All we have to do is allow, allow. You don't have to do all this stuff. You just have to allow them to express. I think so many times we're buying them toys and we're taking them to these places because we don't want them to express. We're trying to give this to them instead of them expressing because them ex us allowing their expression means that we would have to step out of where we are, which is the craziness of our cell phones and the TV and our jobs and our cooking and everything that we're doing. But in our minds, we're doing it for them. So it, it feels balanced, but it's really, it's, it's not. And so if we just put all that stuff down, we'll find that our kids need less stuff, that they need less attention in the long run, that they cost less money um, and that they become more self-sufficient and more capable and more confident within themselves. If all we do, instead of giving them 10 hours a week at the playground, we give them 10 minutes a day of eye to eye contact of this acknowledgement of allowing them to express because when they learn that it's safe to express what they're learning is that it's safe to feel. Because when they feel something and they can't express it, it no longer becomes safe to express, but it no longer becomes safe to feel it either. Because if they're feeling it and it's a yucky feeling, they have no place to go with it. So it's saying, okay, I can't express, therefore I can't feel. Feeling is bad. And then that's when the suppression and the repression starts to really happen. And what that does is it retards their growth. It retards their spiritual growth, their emotional growth, their mental growth and sometimes their physical growth. Like with my son, you know, my story, you see that really, had I continued on that path, he may have broken with some serious illness or it would have kept us out of school or it's really serious stuff. But the best thing you can do is acknowledge them and allow them and, and, and hear them. Thank you. That was so beautiful. Yeah, and it, but it's not easy because, you know, and just to follow up with parents, you know, it, 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 it requires healing on your part. So you can't just fix them. You've got to alter your behavior as well. Mm -hmm. But also kids are very clever. Yeah. Um, so they learn how to manipulate even mm -hmm. the sweetest, most empathetic child who's genuine, authentic, will learn how to manipulate. Yeah. And I can attest to that they will learn, they will learn that you, you take time and that you acknowledge them and that you want them to express. And so they may try to manipulate this to get more attention, to get what is they want. And so there are boundaries here. So I'm not saying you be a puddle, of, you know, you be a pudding for your kid. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, little Jojo wants to express again. We got to drop everything we're doing. You know, I'm on the phone and we got to put down the phone or I'm in a conversation with my husband and I have to stop. It's like, no, no, no. There's a container and there's a time and a place. And so this is the tough part, you know, because my son, oh God bless his heart. Sometimes he just wants the attention mm -hmm. and I understand because sometimes I do too, but I'll be in the middle of a conversation with my husband and he'll say, well, Mommy, I really want to express. Can I express oh. something? <laughs> and it's like, okay, you know, that's the first hint that he's really trying to kind of use my own medicine against me here. And it's like, <laughs> okay, I'm in a conversation with daddy. You know, it needs to wait. You know, he's like, yeah. and he'll say, oh, but it's building up. It's really building up. You don't want it to build up. And I'm just kind of like, huh. okay, where's the balance here? Right. <laughs> and so, um, it's like we want them to know that they're heard and that they're held and that they're acknowledged, but there's also a container within that. And, and that's the tough part because that's for every parent to decide how big or how small or what shape or what size that container is and where it exists in their day. And so really a good thing to do is to have that available at the same time every day for your kid. So like, whether that be on the ride or walk home from school, you know, tell me, tell me about your day. Tell me about how you're feeling. How's your body feeling? You know, what was the best part of the day? What was the worst part of the day? You know, and having that there so that, you know, in case we are very busy or in case we can't be interrupted or whatever it is that we are regularly available for them in that way, in some capacity. 
Yeah. So was there anything that I didn't ask you about that you'd like to talk about today? Yeah, I just want to really touch on, I guess, and this just kind of came to me. I didn't even really prepare for anything. I didn't even like really read the questions that you gave me because I like to just <laughs> be with what comes up, you know? Yeah. Um, but one thing that seems to be coming up are these children who are coming in that may appear to be to have Asperger's or autism or are showing up with these, what I guess people are labeling as disorders or personality disorders. I'm not really sure what they're falling under, but these kids are super sensitive. These kids are super special. And that what's happening is they're coming into this body, into this life, fully awakened, fully spiritually awakened and fully open. So imagine being a fully awakened being and then being crammed into a human body and birthed into a world where everything is very dense and compartmentalized and kind of backwards, really. Mm -hmm. Imagine like everyone's been in a class where the foreign exchange students come in and it's always a hoot because the foreign exchange students like, wait, wait, what do you mean? You guys say this word, but it actually means this, or you do this when you really mean this, that doesn't make sense. And you look at that kid and you're like, Oh my God, he's so silly. He doesn't even know that this is what we do. That when we say no, we really mean yes. You know, like crazy stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so that's like these children coming in. And so there's a lot, there's a jolt, there's a jolt for them of confusion. And so um, it's almost traumatic for these kids to be born, no matter how gentle or how loving you are, it's almost a trauma for them to come into this life. And they're here on this planet to help us ascend, to help everyone grow and enlighten, to help everyone be more present. Think about if you have a kid that has autism, Asperger's or any other kind of condition where, where it's behavioral, where it's emotional, what does it require of you? It requires of you to be so patient, to be so still, to be so present with every move because they're sensitive. If you make the wrong noise or you hand them the wrong food, or if you give them a napkin that's a little bit wet or something, it's like, ah, they can go into a total. So it's requiring the parents to be really mindful really present. And so it's a teaching, it's a learning for the parents, but it's also a learning for our society about slowing down, about being more mindful. And these children are here to shine that light. And so they're not sick. There's nothing wrong with them. They're here as a gift for everyone. And, and look at, at raising them as an opportunity to really heal yourself, to heal those around you and honor them with great gratitude. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this pure light into to show me where I still need to do some work. And you'll you'll find that as as you allow them to heal you, they will begin to heal as well. I love your perspective. Yeah. Thank you. That's just my feelings on it. <laughs> You're welcome. It's amazing. Yeah. And I I've known so many children that do have that and you're right I mean everything you said is exactly on the wall yeah. so to close up do you have like a mantra a quote a prayer vacation that resonates with you that you want to share with us yeah um you know there's so many right there's so many things that resonate it's like ah and I used to have a book of them and hold on to them but now I just kind of like feel them and let them go but this morning I was I was on Instagram and I saw one that really was like, yes, this is one of my favorites because it also speaks to where I am in my healing, in my work with myself, my inner child. I'm doing, it's a, this is a timely interview because I'm doing inner child work with myself. And so it's just so funny. It's like, it's like, how do I handle myself or how do I 
work with my inner child. It's like the same way I work with my son and vice versa. So it's been amazing. But anyway, the quote is by Buddha and I have it written down. So I'm going to look away for a second, but it says in the end, only three things matter. How much you loved, how gently you lived and how gracefully you let go of things not meant for you. So I just love this because it's just, it's like love, how much love can I give? And when it says how gently you lived, it's, it's, yes, it's like, how gently did you tread on the earth? How peaceful were you? But it's also how gentle were you with yourself? You know, Darcy knows I, in all my sessions, it's like, you got to be gentle with yourself. You got to be gentle with yourself. And this includes parenting. When you do have that freak out with your spouse and there's yelling and and the kids witness it or whatever it's like okay yeah that's gonna hurt the kids but instead of us you know whoosh, whoosh, beating ourselves up over it why not be gentle with ourselves and say and look at the kids and say hey you know what i'm really sorry this was mom expressing herself and it, it came out really loud and really scary and I would love to find new ways to express myself, but this is just what happened tonight. So, you know, I'm sorry if it scared you. I, I really hope that um, I can do it differently next time. And so that's what the kids are gonna learn, right? They're gonna, they're going to learn that gentleness with themselves rather than the harshness being like, damn me, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have yelled in front of the kids. I'm messing them up now, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it's the gentleness and, and how gracefully you let go of things not meant for you is all about letting go. It's about letting go of the control, you know, and gosh, in parenting, in all relationships, really, this aspect of control, trying to control others, the way they behave, the way they react, the way that they engage us, it's fruitless and it's like how gracefully can we let go of all that and just kind of surrender to the present moment so that's why i really like that quote because that's totally where i am right now trying to let go gracefully <laughs> nice beautiful yeah thank, thank you. you so much for offering your wisdom for us today i feel like i could talk to you my pleasure for hours and hours but i'm going to end it <laughs> So for the rest of you watching, thank you so much for your attention. If you have a sensitive or empathic child and like to share what works best with your precious one, leave it in the description down below. I would love to hear all about it. Until next time, keep on sparkling. Two years ago, I was working in this little town called Malvern, right outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I was getting acupuncture treatments in this wellness center called Village Wellness, and this is where Stephanie works. So I was just sitting on the table waiting for my acupuncturist to come in. And this is a side note, if you've never had acupuncture before, try it it is amazing it's like a really really good meditation very very relaxing i'm sitting on the table waiting for my acupuncturist to come in and in walks this beautiful goddess with long brown hair big doe eyes her name was stephanie and she popped into the room and apologized she needed to retrieve her crystal bowl and then she left and i don't know what it was about her but I thought, I need to go see her. I don't know what she does here, but I need to go see her. So when I went home, I Googled her and come to find out she was a shamanic healer. When I first went to see her, I had no idea what a huge impact she would make in my life. I had...
a stressful corporate job that paid well, but caused me tons of anxiety that I couldn't control my anxiety. So my anxiety was off the chart. I didn't listen to my interview voice at the time. I suppressed any past traumas. I just ignored them, which reappeared as fibromyalgia, which was severe pain to my legs, my extremities. I struggled with hypothyroidism. And then I did unhealthy things for my body, like I drank and I didn't exercise. So Stephanie gently took me under her wings and helped me remove all of these issues from my past and that I just listed. And I know it seems unbelievable, but I wouldn't believe it if it hadn't happened to me, but it happened to me. I'm not making it up. I'm not exaggerating. I booked a session with her and the session started off really really nice uh, she got to know me we had a conversation for like 15 20 minutes and then she had me uh, lay on a table fully clothed and she started her shamanic healing it usually started off with some type of she calls it an illumination where you blow your issue into the rock and then she'll place the rock on one of your chakras on your body to start the healing. Her healings are amazing. And every time I went in for a healing, it was like a new adventure. It was like nothing else I've ever experienced in my life. It really, really was a new adventure. I'll give you an example of one of the healings. I'll give you a couple examples. She had just started working on me and she was at my head and she looked down upon me and she said, who, who's picking on you at work? And I said, oh, it's a girl named Jennifer. She's a little upset because they gave me her classes to teach. She wasn't doing a good job. And so she installed, Stephanie installed these things called bands of power on me. And they were just kind of like a shield around your body. And I had no idea what it was. Jennifer did not even glance at me anymore. She didn't even, t I don't think she ever, we ever came in contact with each other after that. Where before the bands of power, it was like a daily basis of her being mean, saying mean stuff to me, doing mean things to me, like a mean girl would. And so those bands of power that Stephanie installed immediately worked. And it was like, I thought it was like magic. It was amazing. There was one time Stephanie did something called a soul retrieval, which back then I had no idea what a soul retrieval was. She just asked me, what happened to you when you're four years old? And I told her about a traumatic incident that happened to me when I was four years old. And she said she was going to go retrieve that soul. Well, I had no idea that souls split off from the body and left if there was some type of trauma. But she went and got that soul and she actually brought back two other soul parts for me. On top of the first one, she brought back two other ones and blew them into my body. It felt so good. Uh, when she integrated those soul parts back into my body, it was like my, my long last best friend that I hadn't seen for years that was missing came back and I didn't realize I had needed it until, and how much I missed it until it was integrated back into my body. So soul retrievals is something she does. They're very, very quick process. It not, it's not like it takes hours. I don't even think it took her five minutes to go retrieve that soul, actually three of them, and come back. So she'll do soul retrievals. She'll scan my body and she'll say what happened to your left ankle 
and I, I'll tell her, oh, I twisted it. She would just run energy through it and it would stop hurting. And she did that for me quite a bit. Those kind of processes. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else she, she does so much. A lot of times, like a trauma in my body would be associated to something in my past. And so I could think, oh, my stomach hurts. And then she could actually relate it to, when did your stomach first hurt? When's the first time your stomach hurt? When you could think back, when is the first time? And somehow I could relate it to an incident that happened and then we would go ahead and uh, resolve that incident and then it would just dissipate and my stomach would not hurt anymore. So on top of being this phenomenal healer, Stephanie is a really kind, caring, and just a smart person. I feel like so many people that I've dealt with even in the spiritual community are just interested in the cl in getting clients, making money. And of course, we all want to make money. We all want clients. But that is not Stephanie's focus. Her focus is, can I help you? How can I help you? What can we do to make your life better? That is her focus. Just to let you know that she does do healings remotely until, I think until COVID calms down a little bit. If you have any aches, pains, or deal with any type of addictions, you've tried conventional medicine, conventional medicine has not worked for you, and you've kind of given up, go ahead and give Stephanie a try. You may be surprised about how well she works and how easy it is and it is worth every penny and i don't feel like she overcharges actually i feel like she should charge more for her services but she doesn't she's very reasonable there are squirrels like talking to me there's a dark luminous sky and there are gunshots in the background so i hope oh. this <laughs> i hope this goes well <laughs> <laughs> i like Whatever. oh my <laughs>